In the context of declining government investment in public services and minimal economic growth, what kind of civil society does the panel think we need to be developing in order to drive economic and social inclusion and meet the needs of people and communities? Stuart. Well, what I think is that no matter whether or not there was significant economic growth tomorrow, whether there was significant increases in public, uh, the capability of investing public spending tomorrow, I think we're in a situation where uh, needs are outstripping the level of, of, of taxpayers' ability to fund uh, a response to those needs, period. So I think the idea, even if there was a slightly different economic scenario, there would have to be a debate about different ways of uh, intervening, different ways of creating new mutualism, new self-help, new, new ways of people beginning to assist one another in reciprocal ways. So I suppose what I would say is, is uh, part of this is an economic argument, but part of this is the fact that, you know, uh, I'm not sure that w we will get back to a situation where, uh, or, it w or ever had a situation necessarily where the tax base and public spending would have been enough to fulfil every human need. So my argument, I think, is e even if it was a different economic scenario, I think we would have to develop ways of mutual support over and above that. So m the civil society that I would like to see, I'd like to see more of a discussion about generating, how you generate more associational mutuality and cooperation amongst groups of citizens um, than just a contractual relationship. Thank you, Stuart, very much. Lord Wallace, what's your take on this one? Well, I agree very strongly. I mean, look at our ageing society, look at expectations. The, the demand for better public services is, is unavoidably outstripping what people are prepared to accept that government will pay for because a, a, a government take which rises way above 50% is not something they are willing to pay for. We, we all know that. So we have to, to rebuild much more local engagement, self-help, volunteers working with public service provision in order to provide the elderly care, the help for uh, small children. And we also need to reverse um, an assumption of the state locally and centrally providing, which I think has grown unhealthily strong. I, there are parts, again, of Bradford and Leeds I know well, where people leave a great deal of rubbish in their gardens and complain that the, the council does not come and clear up. Um, well, um, actually persuaded them that they could clear up their own front garden and back garden and the local street is a necessary part of saying we can't do everything for you. It's actually very unhealthy if the state does everything for you. Um, I was also talking to uh, a, a local community association about what does one do about children who arrive in the reception class at the age of four and have great difficulty speaking. Well, again, one can expect services to provide that, but it, ought, it was a hundred years ago the aunts and the very local community who helped to bring up small children. We've got to move back to some of that, again, because the demands on the state uh, have grown too large. I also think the state has grown too remote. I walk around West Yorkshire and see all the old RDC and UDC town halls um, and recognise that when you have a ward which has 15,000 electors, local government isn't terribly local any longer. Uh, and, and the Localism Act proposing the, <coughs> the uh, encouragement wherever possible of urban parish councils, neighbourhood councils, getting back to encouraging people to recognise that what happens locally is partly your concern and your responsibility is a very important part of, of the agenda which I, as a Liberal, thinking about uh, a strong society and limited government, very much believe in and always have believed in. So we've got mutualism, more of from Stuart, uh, more local action and so on from Lord Wallace or Gareth Thomas, your take? Well, I'm up for both of those things. I think um, one of the most interesting um, pieces of work that I've seen in, in um, the sh comparatively short time that I've been doing this job 
um, was actually in um, Cheatham Hill in Manchester. It's been done by um, Urban Forum and um, the Centre for Local Economic Strategies, and that is looking at the resilience of a particular um, community and looking at the way in which resources uh, from the state, from the private sector and indeed within um, civil society are being allocated um, to help um, the people in, um, in that community. It is of course true that the state will never be able to do anything, um, but um, <laughs> there is so much that the um, state can do and there is so much of a, a debate that one can have about the way in which state resources are allocated to those who are um, most in need and to help galvanise other investment into, um, into communities. So one of the pieces of work that certainly I am interested in um, and which seems to me to be one of the big strategic questions that faces um, the future of civil society um, after the next um, general election is how do you get far more investment um, into um, local, um, local communities so that civil society working alongside um, local government, uh, other agencies of the state like the NHS um, or, the or the police and of course the private sector can um, generate more benefit um, for the people in that community. I just wanted to get back to the point now um, about four-year-olds. I, I, I understand this narrative about the development of, of community capacity, civil society and so on, but a four-year-old turning up at a reception class unable to communicate properly has not had the stimulation that that four-year-old needs. She's not going to, he or she won't get it from an aunt. He or she is going to get uh, what may do, but actually what, what, what we experience in the communities that we work in, um, which tend to be very deprived, very disadvantaged communities, is families who don't themselves have huge vocabularies. And there is a huge disparity between those people who, I mean, when I did the Early Years Foundation stage review, supported by Sarah Tether, um, what was really clear is that there are some children who are exposed to maybe 800 words against other children who've been exposed to 8,000 words. And unless we can find ways of stimulating those children and, and exposing them to vocabulary and understanding, um, getting their parents to understand and to intervene with those parents, we haven't got a cat in hell's chance. And shoving them over to an aunt isn't going <laughs> to do that stuff. And there is something about understanding that, of course, we need to develop community capacity, but the state howsoever defined, has a role in seed, seed corn funding in terms of, 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 of assisting communities to assist themselves. And that's not going to happen just by shunting people around to different people. I okay. had, had to make that point. It's a really interesting uh, question that we're facing, and I'm uh, thinking back to a survey done by the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, which showed that at the same time as turnout in, elect in, in elections diminished, so did the level of volunteering. And just referring back, uh, Gareth, to what you said about local volunteer centres and the fragmentation there, I mean, isn't there a case for actually investing in that local uh, level, that infrastructure at local level, in order to strengthen participative democracy? Gareth, quick response to that. Um, well, I think there is, and I think um, you know there are cho other choices that the government could have made um, with uh, over tax uh, over tax policy, which would have allowed more resources for the state to invest, be it in um, early years or be it in um, volunteer centres. There would have had to have been cuts. I've been quite clear about that, but they didn't need to have been as deep um, or as fast um, and have the scale of impact. Um, that, they, um, that they are having. So in my view, there will always be a role um, for government um, through the redistribution of resources to target help at those who most, uh, who most need it. The issue about um, democracy and the way in which we uh, reignite um, interest in um, democracy, I think is a, much, uh, is a much bigger question. It's something that um, others in our party are beginning to, beginning to look at. And I think it's a challenge that faces all um, um, political parties at the moment. Lord Andrew Phillips. This is, in a way, the biggest challenge of the lot. How do we revive community life? And I'd just like their comments on what seems to me to be at the heart of the difficulty, and that is, in my lifetime, I've seen the virtual withdrawal from leadership in communities of what one might call the natural elite. Um, if you look at the, the great uh, interest groups in society, whether it's business or the professions, uh, today, uh, if take my own profession of solicitors, uh, when I started, they were pillars of the local community. Today, most of them are far too busy and pressured 
in their jobs and few are actually heavily engaged. You take the city, you won't find one in ten of the nabobs of the city has any involvement in public life at all. Uh, and, and I think that has a huge drawback uh, in terms of civic vitality. And I just wondered whether are there are any ideas uh, thank, from your panel. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew Phillips, for, for that question. We'll put that very quickly. I want one sentence, please, from or one idea. What can we do um, to reactivate community action and activity? Lord Wallace, in getting into your response to that, would you like to just uh, respond to the point made by Claire to Kell on young yes, under age children? Yes, I, I recognise there's a huge problem. Um, and it's, and, and I, I note the hostility of the media to addressing the problem. The Daily Mail had a, a vicious attack on the government's attempts to encourage people to, to, to learn about parenting, saying that we're all going to middle class, the anxious middle class, and not to those who really need it. I, there, there is a very large issue there. Actually, the, the local communities that I began to grow up in but were still there had Sunday schools, had quite a lot of local activity. We knocked those communities down across the north of England, and that's part of what we've lost, the, the local community support which people used to have. I'm very well aware about uh, infant social development because I have my first grandchild, 17 months old, and I'm very conscious of the, the interaction between how much you talk to children and how they learn to speak. On city involvement and um, community leadership, I, I would say a personal, and I'm, I'm very pleased that my son-in-law, who I regret to say is an investment banker, um, <laughs> spends a day, a fortnight, in uh, a local secondary school acting as mentor to 16-year-olds. And uh, that's something which, it, which is banking carriages. It's not a British-owned bank, I have to say. Um, but, uh, and that is precisely the sort of thing that, that uh, we should be doing. The government, as you know, is encouraging civil servants to devote some of their time to this. Okay, thank you, Lord Wallace. That, that's one idea. Gareth Thomas, uh, an idea to re-engage community? With, with respect, I think the focus on elites is, is wrong. I think there's as much talent in people who are not solicitors or not investment bankers, but who do other kinds of uh, work or indeed no work um, in, um, in communities. And the challenge is, is surely about how do you create a culture across the country um, to encourage more um, social action. I actually think there are examples of um, businesses that are um, leading the way in, in encouraging their staff um, to, uh, to volunteer and uh, to get involved in their community. There are plenty who aren't. And again, one of the um, issues that we are starting to look at is how do you shift that? Are there legislative um, uh, triggers that might push uh, more um, people to, uh, to volunteer? Um, is it simply about creating um, rewards um, for people um, to do so, either through recognition or not? Those are, there is a cultural shift um, that is required. Uh, it isn't, I think, in just one particular part of the community. It's in a series of um, parts of the community. Uh, yeah, just, one very, idea. just very briefly, I, I think this is a cultural issue. Uh, I think, in part, this is because we spent the last 30 years marketising everything, uh, that we only understand relationships between each other in market terms. And you talk about lawyers, you know, I personally know one quite well. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and she's not the most market-driven, but, 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 but inevitably, uh, you know, in order to compete effectively, people are spending more and more hours in the workplace. There's less and less cultural opportunities. I don't think it's also about, it's about leadership, but it, it's also about example. Uh, and, and I think there are plenty of examples of where people do this effectively. Uh, and I think we do need to change, and I think, I don't know whether there are legislative triggers or, or a lot of it's about example. Yeah. Uh, and I do think we need to find more if you like, heroic examples of people who see this as an important component in their lives. This is, this is, the, this is at the core of humanity. Uh, it's what we're for. We're not just consumers.